Morning all. Okay, let's have a look at another crunch game for the USA in their final round encounter against Poland. We have the very young Grandmaster Ray Robson, 2598. Uh, I think he's approaching 18 still, or 1994, according to the FIDE uh, records I have here. Uh, so currently ranked 9 in the USA, 1994 birth year. Uh, so he's playing against Massager 2594, so someone just about the same rating as him. He's got the advantage of the white pieces. He kicks off with e4. We see the Sicilian defense. After knight f3, knight c6, he doesn't chicken out with bishop b5 or play, you know, anti Sveshnikov system bishop b5, which is very, very popular at the moment. He plays the open Sicilian d4. So black takes on d4. After knight takes d4, we see e6. He's not afraid of the pin variation with uh, bishop b4 here. He invites that, but black plays queen c7. And then we see bishop e3. And black plays a6. A little point of note, black's a little bit vulnerable on dark squares. If this, ex if this bishop gets exchanged off, black would have potentially uh, losing dark square weaknesses here. Queen d2 after knight f6, white castles queenside. Not worried about this pin here again. Let's just check this pin in this in this position. Bishop b4, what does white actually do about this? f3 apparently is adequate. If something like d5 we can play a3 maybe if bishop a5 we can play knight b3 so it doesn't seem as though there's a big deal about the pin even with white casting queenside in this position so let's go back to the game continuation knight takes d4 was played hmm is to capture a mistake here one gm on youtube is saying about captures how they sometimes improve the opponent's position is white's position improved after queen takes d4? Well, actually, queen takes d4. If white is not necessarily hooked on a kingside onslaught with the queens on, there are these dark squares to play on, in particular queen b6 as an interesting resource to lock down also black's light square bishop. And indeed, after knight g4, this interesting resource is made use of here to attack the black queen. Queen c6. And we see a weakness provocation move now, bishop d4. So black can't easily move this bishop, it seems, because you know queen takes and taking on g7. Um, that seems unpleasant. Doesn't really perhaps want to take on b6 here. He, he concedes d5 a little bit with e5. That d5 gaping hole now is created. Bishop e3. And okay, so Ray's not bothered about this bishop uh, coming off here because this d5 control will be strengthened if black hasn't got a knight to contest d5. Black plays bishop e7 here and we see it actually positively encouraged. h3, take my bishop and black did and we start to see uh, now the stem of what is to be uh, a positional struggle for the d5 square and making use of that. g3 and with black playing queen c5 he doesn't mind uh, simplifying the position and white doesn't mind either. He simplifies. After h4 we, we see the idea that well bishop h3 might be on the cards potentially. g5 more control over g5 to stop any bishop g5. The pawn might be useful in its own right later. Bishop e6 actually knight d5 now. Immediately pressing knight c7 check, rook d8. Okay, so black doesn't mind healing d5 on knight c7, say he can just do this, and he doesn't mind this structure with opposite colored bishops. He's got d5 under control. But in the game continuation, uh, white keeps the control on d5. After bishop takes d5, we see it pronounced now. And in fact, it's white's constituent main advantage that although d4 we've got a pawn on c3, which can come to c3, 
black can't do the same so black has to put up with this huge bishop now on d5 here so c3 which is useful of course for king c2 and I'm doing some queenside operations later if the rook wants to come to a1 and we see that king c2 after b5 we'd see a temporary pawn sack just with the idea that uh, it's, white's going to recollect that pawn with interest with a6 frontal attack on a6 so black plays c4 and white makes an inroad now on the queen side the a file so with rook a1 the positional advantages are increasing bishop c4 f4 protecting the pawn takes takes rook fc8 h5 so white just has a very pleasant position even though it's opposite color bishops that control of the a file uh, means black's task is quite difficult here some maneuvering for a moment now this pawn is not protected I think because of the tactic uh, rook f1 it can't be taken here uh, let's just end and check this critical tactic there's no nasty surprise I guess rook f1 and white crashing through on f7 is to be avoided so black um, goes back and we see more space gain with e5 now targeting h7 that's protected now rook d1 as though rook d6 could be a menace and in fact in this position undermining white center white plays rook d6 bishop has to move now rook dc6 getting rid of rid of one pair of rooks now rook f6 counter-attacking on black's pawns which are now quite exposed so both pawn structures are in meltdown here at the same time potentially king e7 bishop d5 hitting f7 again now hitting the bishop now taking on g5 and can black take on e5 here that's the question or is rook h6 too powerful let's see in the game rook g8 was played but if bishop takes e5 is the idea is white's main idea rook h6 it's not mentioned okay uh, rook c5 rook h6 is actually quite bad or it's a reasonable move okay so rook c5 and we have this idea that if rook b8 well, we just take on f7 bishop f4 we can just take on b5 and then probably take on f7 or just take on c4 okay so we'd have two connected past pawns here and that would be okay for white quite good but the opposite color bishop scenario is a little bit of concern if it's going to be a draw uh, remember Necker had um, been crushed uh, on on board one um, I hope you've seen the NACA video before this and I didn't spoil the result there <laughs> so so basically Ray uh, it's helpful if Ray wins this game anyway I'm, I'm not entirely sure of the sequence of results actually but I assume no actually I believe uh, this this was one of the last games to finish because uh, we have a lot of moves to carry on now from this position rook c5 attacking b5 now instead of rook takes b5 actually actually something uh, a little bit more cunning is played here I wonder if you can spot it if I give you 10 seconds starting from now okay g6 using the pin is that actually technically a lot stronger than rook takes b5 that little finesse g6 yes it's it's given us one of the strongest moves in fact gives white a very marked advantage look at that valuation shift so had black actually gone wrong here we saw in this position rook g8 so maybe that's that's not too hooked maybe rook e8 is better it's going into that um tactical you know pin which is made use of now so if if takes uh, i guess bishop f7 if if the rook moves then we we just have hg so uh black plays rook b8 and he's a bit in trouble now he's in trouble that evaluation is horrible for black here he's lost a key pawn there and you know his bishop is also attacked with this move so he has to move the bishop as well and he's losing another pawn so it's two pawns up 
can the opposite colour bishops really hold this? Well, okay, black plays now b4, bishop f7, as though rook g8 is a menace. Attacking c3, that's protected. Now rook g8. So swapping the bishops off. So now this rook ending. A lot of checks. A lot of checks. Now h6 here. Now we see again a lot of potential checks. And the king is now driving forward after king f4. Okay, now rook d8 in this position. Was that an important move to play rook d8 in this position at move 69? Why not king g6? Or are there many roads to win this position? Rook d8 is actually quite incisive according to an engine. If king g6, it's still okay. Why well, hasn't? Well, the progress is made with rook d8 offering that pawn as in the game, it seems. Because White wants the rook on h7 as a tempo gainer uh, to be able to play king g6, the more infiltrating king g6. So it's necessary to give up the front of the double pawns. So that's given up for that tempo gain king g6. And now h7, and it's all over. And here, black resigned. Very, very important win. Well done to Ray Robson. Um, so, very talented and, and very young still. So, he's got a few Olympiads ahead of him. And um, USA uh, finished very credibly in this Olympiad. Rank 5. So, just outside of the top 3. They had some brilliant highlights in the event, in the event like beating Russia, Naka beating uh, Kramnik in a key game. Uh, so congratulations, USA! What a fantastic Olympia performance. In England did did okay. Um, I think around rank 17 in the end. Um, was it 17? Yes, yeah, 17. So well done to the USA for coming rank fifth, just below China, who were rank fourth. Of course, um, so Armenia, Russia, and Ukraine were the top three, um, three placed teams in this Olympiad. Uh, so very important game this one for the USA in the final round, though. Uh, so there was one other decisive game which, which turned the match to USA's advantage because the other game was a draw, and we might might go over that other game in this channel um, maybe later today or tomorrow. <laughs> I don't want to make a firm commitment just yet. Okay, comments or questions on YouTube. Um, actually, did we do a brief summary? It was a bit of a positional grind, this one. That control of d5 um, was a long-term thing to make use of, that white had. So even though it was opposite colour bishops, we saw a file being used, very instructive, showing how you can grind out wins with great determination from the opposite colour bishop scenario. But it helped that black seem to go in right into this skewer, visual skewer, um, for g6 to be on the cards in, in these variations. Um, sorry, one important note about rook takes g5 looks looks like a very, very tempting move. Why did I not mention that? Rook takes g5 here. Let's just check out rook takes g5. The key move here is e6. I see. Uh, so we have a tactical idea of this rook being actually loose on g5. So if it takes, we have bishop e6. Pardon me. Yes, rook takes g5 looked like a viable move, but it fails tactically to e6. And um, if if the king um, moves off, then we lose the bishop. Uh, rook takes c7. If it if if here, then e takes f7. I guess for the queening, uh, threatening to queen the pawn. And this is very, very nice for white. Okay, so black started to go downhill here uh, with this tactic g6 being used. That marked out clear advantage for white. And um, the rook and pawn ending impossible to hold here. The king just marches down, with assisted by a pawn sacrifice at this key moment, sacrificing h7. Okay, comments or questions on YouTube? Thanks very much.